Okay, in this video we're going to go over gravitational potential energy. Only this time we're going to con consider situations where we are far from the surface of the Earth and we need to include the fact that gravity falls off as the inverse square, the distance. Where we're, go where we're going to do this is we're going to consider how much work it takes to move an object. We'll consider a ping pong ball from a distance r from the center of the Earth out all, all the way out to being infinitely far away. And we're compute how much work that takes. Well, work, of course, will be force times distance, only now the force will follow the inverse square law, so we have to include the fact that the force varies, so we're going to integrate f dot dr, where f will follow Newton's law of gravity, because although we'll be applying the force, we'll be applying a force that is always equal and exactly opposite, to the force of gravity which follows this inverse square law. We'll treat this as a vector, so it's radially outward along the x-axis. The x-axis will be this right here, going directly out from the center of the Earth. It's positive because we're pushing the ping pong ball away with a force equal to gravity. dr will be a little increment of distance, which will be along the x-axis, so it'll be i times dx. And then we're going to integrate from our initial position, which will be at r, to our final position, which will be infinitely far away. So to write this all out, the work will be the integral from r to infinity of g m m over x squared dx. g m m are constants, we factor them out. The antiderivative of 1 over x squared is minus 1 over x, and we'll evaluate that from x equals r to the limit of x going to infinity. Here we have to be careful with our plus and minus signs. So the constant we have out in front is minus gmm, and then times the quantity of zero, which is the limit as x goes to infinity, minus one over r, which is when x equals r. This minus sign and that minus sign cancel out. So the final result is the work that we need to do is a positive quantity gmm over r. So we have to do positive work in order to move the ping pong ball from a distance r all the way to be infinitely far away. Now we're going to want to relate that work to the change in gravitational potential energy. Work is in general the change in energy. Here it's going to be the gain in gravitational potential energy because we never applied a net force to the ping pong ball. So as a result, there will be no change in its kinetic energy. All the change will be in gravitational potential energy. So the work that we do on the ball will equal the gain in gravitational potential energy. Now, this is only the change in potential energy. So we need to pick a reference point where we consider GPE to equal zero. Before, we picked the floor. That was a convenient reference point. Now we'd kind of like a common reference point relevant to essentially any celestial object when we're some distance away from it. Well, the most convenient common reference point would be something that is infinitely far away. So what we're going to take, and this is really just a convention, the gravitational potential energy will go to zero as r goes to infinity. This is just a convention that is often used for forces that follow an inverse square law. Now, we need to develop our sign conventions by keeping our plus and minus signs very consistent. So we're going to take our ping pong ball, move it from r to infinity. The net work done on the ping pong ball will be the work done by gravity plus the work we do. Technically, that equals the change in kinetic energy, but that was zero because we always applied a net force of zero, which means the work done by gravity is minus the work that we do. The work that we did was the gain in gravitational potential energy. Therefore, the work gravity does will equal a loss in gravitational potential energy. Now, the change in gravitational potential energy is always the final minus the initial. The initial is whatever it has at a distance r. This is what we want to find out. What is the gravitational potential energy at some distance r from the center of the Earth? The final one, when we went all the way out to infinity, that is by definition zero. That's the convention that we picked. So therefore, the change in gravitational potential energy is final minus initial. And that's the work done by us, the force F which is therefore gmm over r, that's what we calculated, and that's the final potential minus the initial, final is zero, minus the initial, so the initial therefore is minus gmm over r, 
Now, often people use the symbol U for, for potential energy, and U sub G will be gravitational potential energy. So the general expression is U sub G is equal to minus GMM over R. Note a couple of things. First, the potential energy is negative. That's the result of our sign convention with the uh, potential energy being zero at infinity. That made the potential energy to be negative at less than infinity. And also notice that it follows an inverse, not an inverse square law. So now if we calculate the total energy of an object, it's, it's kinetic plus its potential, 1 half mv squared, potential is minus gmm over r. That is the total energy of an object moving in a gravitational field following an inverse square law. Okay, now we can calculate what is known as the escape velocity. For an object to, if you will, escape, let's say, the Earth, it must reach an infinite distance away. And we're going to calculate how much it takes to just barely escape, so that means when it's infinitely far away, it comes to rest. We're going to do this by using energy. The final energy, when it is infinitely far away, will be the sum of its final kinetic and its final potential. We will assume the kinetic energy will be zero, which is to say it, again, barely escapes. We have defined the potential energy at that point to be zero when you're infinitely far away, which means the final energy must be zero. And by the conservation of energy, the energy has to always be zero, which means the infinite, the initial energy must also be zero. So the initial energy is the sum of the kinetic and the potential, and this is what it has at the surface of the Earth to begin with. That's the minus gmm over r, and those two must add up to zero. When we solve this, the mass of the object cancels out. We solve that for the initial velocity, and that initial velocity would become our escape velocity. And the escape velocity, therefore, is the square root of 2 gm over r. One thing to note is, again, the mass of the object is irrelevant because all objects effectively fall at the same rate, so the mass of the object is irrelevant. And this is uh, how fast an object has to be going in order to escape at a distance r from a mass m. We can then calculate some values for the escape velocity. If we take the mass to be the mass of the Earth, our initial distance to be the radius of the Earth, so that's how far away we are from the center, plug those numbers in and we find the escape velocity for the Earth is 11.2 kilometers per second. Now, if we're instead want to escape the Sun from the Earth's orbit, we take the mass to be the mass of the Sun, the distance to be the average distance uh, from the Earth at its orbit, and we get the escape velocity is this. Now, one thing you have to be careful about is this assumes that we are not moving when we're at the Earth, Earth's orbit. This will be an object that is at rest with respect to the Sun at this distance. And how much velocity does it have to gain in order to escape the Sun? Well, of course, if you're on the Earth, you would be moving with the Earth, which means you would be both rotating with the Earth and have the Earth's orbital speed. That makes the calculation a little bit different. Now, next thing we want to look at is what is the force of gravity at all distances r? Namely, what is the force of gravity above the surface of the Earth? Well, that follows the inverse square law. Well, what about inside the surface of the Earth? What is the force of gravity inside? So here... Newton basically derived the following theorem, and he proved this, that for a force following an inverse square law, if you're inside a hollow sphere of mass m, the gravity inside the sphere is zero. The gravity outside the sphere follows the inverse square law. Because when you're inside the sphere, you have mass above you, below you, to the right, to the left, in front of you, behind you, all of them pulling you away from them, away from your point, and therefore all of those forces add up to zero. Clearly we can see at the very center this is true, because all of the mass is at the same distance from you. When you're not at the center, uh, Newton proved this, but we can kind of see qualitatively why this is true, because over here we have some mass that is close to us, but there's not that much. It'll pull us in this direction. Over here we have more mass, but it's farther away from us, but the cumulative effect of all of this mass at this greater distance is to pull us with a force that is exactly equal to this mass. The two forces, therefore, counterbalance each other, and it turns out that is true in all directions at all points. And that does require a little bit of a calculus proof to show that.
Uh, Newton needed calculus to show this. The important thing is that when you're inside here, the mass above you does not exert a force on you. We can use that to find out what the gravity inside the Earth would look like. So that when we're at this distance r from the center of the Earth, so this would be this would be the surface of the Earth, and we're at a distance little r from the center of the Earth, capital R would be the overall radius of the Earth. The mass above us, this blue mass, does not contribute to the force. So what we're going to do is calculate what is the force at this distance little r from the center of the Earth. The way we're going to do that is calculate the density of the Earth, the mass divided by the volume. This is the total mass of the Earth divided by its total volume. The mass under our feet, if you will, we'll call m prime, is equal to the density times the volume under our feet, which I'll call v prime. This right here is the density, so take this and move it down here. This is the volume under our feet, this black volume right here, 4 thirds pi r cubed. And then the 4 thirds pi's cancel out. So we end up with the total mass of the Earth times the ratio of the mass, the ratio of the radius of the little sphere divided by the radius of the Earth cubed. Take this right here, substitute it in here, because the only force we need to worry about is the mass under our feet. That's this mass right here. This is our mass. This is the universal constant g. This is the inverse square law. Take this expression and put it in here. Basically, two of those r's are canceled out by the r squared, and all we're left with is an r on the top. Everything else is a constant. So inside the surface of the Earth, the force of gravity is minus a constant times r, which means it very much looks like a spring that follows Hooke's law. This leads to the interesting outcome that if you were to drill a hole through the Earth and drop an object into that hole, it would oscillate up and down very much like a mass at the end of a spring. It would exhibit simple harmonic motion. Now what we can do is draw a graph of the force of gravity versus distance. And inside the Earth, it follows Hooke's law, so it's a straight line. Right here, we reach the surface of the Earth. Once we're above the surface of the Earth, the force falls off as the inverse square. So here we have our inverse square law. So this is the force from the center of the Earth out. Now, using our relationship between force and potential energy, namely the force is minus the derivative of the potential energy, we can then look at what is the potential energy of the Earth as a function of distance. This right here is the center of the Earth, this is the surface of the Earth, and this is above the surface of the Earth. In here we have the Hooke's Law, and here the potential energy would be parabolic. This is a piece of a parabolic arc. Right here is where it meets at the surface of the Earth, and above there it falls off as basically a hyperbola, or 1 over r and eventually going to zero as r becomes infinitely large. Notice the potential energy is always increasing with distance. It is, in fact, becoming less negative. So we are seeing the potential energy get larger as you move farther away. As you do work and move something farther away, you do, in fact, gain potential energy. But it really means you're losing negative potential energy. So there is our graph of the potential energy as a function of distance.